The notion of decolonization speaks to two different but related aspects. The first one is a historical period. The second one is a conceptual frame. The two are related in that they speak to the manner in which the world has been practiced in international relations and is conceptualized. Both are also related in that they speak fundamentally to the notion of undoing of colonialism. First, and setting aside earlier waves of decolonization, such as those that took place in the Portuguese and Spanish empires, or earlier in the 20th century in the Ottoman Empire, decolonization is essentially in the modern day period that moment in the middle of the 20th century in which a number of countries that had been colonized for roughly a century, a century and a half, depending on the specific case, came into being and uh, emerging as independent nations. The decolonized nations were essentially in Asia, Africa and the Middle East and going away from the colonizing countries that had been essentially European. From roughly 1945 to 1965, some 75 countries came into independence. These countries had been uh, colonized in different formats, depending on the relationship with the colonizer country. They had been either administered territories, protectorates, full-fledged departments, and so the manner in which they met with their independence was either peaceful or violent, as it were. Colonialism, of course, had impacted these nations for many centuries and for a long period. In the deeper understanding of it, starting roughly from the post-Reconquista period, from 1492 to about 1914, the eve of World War I, um, Europe had come in control of about 80% of the world's land mass. In the 19th century, colonialism became more sophisticated, more systematic, and these countries experienced, the colonized countries experienced a different type of imprint on their societies at administrative, socioeconomic, and political level. Administratively, territories were carved, put together, administered in ways that had not necessarily existed in the pre-colonial period. These administrative sets were very consequential in the decolonized period in terms of what type of nations would emerge, generating all manners of issues and challenges in terms of border control and frontiers between these countries. Many of the post-colonial conflicts had to do with that. Socioeconomically, of course, colonialism generated the impoverishment, the exploitation of these territories, which were essentially used as sources of manpower, sources of transplanting of um, natural resources to Europe at the same time as the Industrial Revolution, generating an impoverishment here and an enrichment there. And thirdly, politically, the colonial experience had, of course, divided the lands into different identities, some old and new, some collaborators, some resistant um, elites, uh, rural, urban, all manners of binaries that also went into the decolonial period, generating all manners of tensions within these territories, as it were. In the post-colonial period, as the territories emerged into sovereign nations, they of course met with the challenge of finding their place in the world. Decolonization took place in the context as well or in parallel as it were with the Cold War, that ideological contest that pitted East and West for some 40 years from the late 1940s to the late 1980s. Those countries that had been emerging as independent decolonized states that refused this binary alignment uh, went to organize the non-aligned movement. And following the conference in Bandung in 1955, um, a movement was born led by a number of leaders from these countries, Yugoslavia's Tito, Egypt's Nasser, uh, Ghana's Nkrumah, uh, Indonesia's uh, Sukarno, and India's Nehru. The non-aligned movement became one of these umbrella forms for these nations to essentially make their voice heard to the world and bring their own set of concerns. Decolonization was either peaceful or violent. Some of the most violent episodes took place in Indochina, in Algeria, in Cameroon, in Kenya. In Indochina, the French fought a ruthless war against the independentists from 1946 to 1954 until the French army was defeated in Dien Bien Phu in May 1954. The French went on to fight an even more ruthless war against the Algerian independentists until 1962, generating roughly 
1 to 1.5 million dead in Algeria. As a result of these tensions, we saw also that these episodes were not taking place, of course, in isolation. The violence itself, the counter-violence, was to be found throughout the continents, Asia, Africa, the Middle East. The British uh, experienced similar uh, um, tensions and projected similar ruthlessness in Malaysia, earlier um, fighting the so-called Malaysian emergency from 1948 until 1962, in Kenya fighting the Mau Mau rebellion from 1952 to 1960, as it were. Upon becoming nations, of course, the, during decolonization, these countries were essentially also realizing that the ties with the former colonial countries were not so easily set aside. Colonialism had been too long, the relationships too deep, the imprint too strong, and so finding their place in the world in that manner was quite difficult, uh, as it were. The developments that followed also led to the rise of something that has been referred to as neocolonialism, in which during this period some of these states were finding ways or developing ways uh, to maintain ties with the former colonial uh, countries, which spoke essentially to a type of control, though not necessarily a direct control, but through political, economic and strategic control. Neocolonialism was facilitated by the complicity of many of the post-colonial regimes who, using a set of regimes which were uh, corrupt, authoritarian, despotic, and fundamentally functioning on a system of a patrimonial uh, structure, were finding manners of maintaining their grip on power while serving as client states for these former colonies, colonial states. One such example is Mobutu Sese Seko's Zaire, now known as the RDC, the Republic of Democratic Congo, amongst other examples. As the 1970s moved forward and as we came into the 1980s, the post-colonial state was finding also all manners of challenges in relation to the state building process. These countries had to develop and create, in many cases, uh, states that had to be viable, that were able to deliver services, that had to generate essentially um, a type of legitimacy which needed to be grounded in all manners of relationships with societies with ha that had been left in many ways uh, divided and in many cases pitted against each other. The challenge of state building for the post-colonial state is one of the big stories of the decolonization moment and in many ways it's still ongoing. At the tail end of the sequence, we see, of course, that many of these countries that had come now onto the world stage, some 750 million people had been essentially decolonized during this whole period, had now essentially entered the realm of the international discussion, were changing the very parameters of how the global conversation was taking place by taking and bringing on their own concerns. Decolonization is, secondly, also a frame of reading the world. It is a school of thought, a critical thinking approach to understanding the world that had come alongside decolonization as a historical phase. In fact, arguably, it predated it because some of the theories and some of the writings was developed to generate the anti-colonial movements that led to the decolonization movements. Some of the thinkers that essentially led on that front were Franz Fanon, Albert Memmi, Aimé César, um, Edouard Said, uh, Gayatri Spivak, Dipesh Chakravarti, amongst many others. Some of the key texts are Franz Fanon's Black Skin, White Masks, 1952, Albert Memmi, The Colonizer and the Colonized, in 1957, later on, Edouard Said's Orientalism in 1978, and its sequel, Culture and Imperialism, in 1994, amongst many such works that essentially produced a way of reading the world in critical terms, shining the light on the voices of the unseen, of the dispossessed, of those that had been exploited and abused and whose worldviews had been missing and missed from the understanding of international relations. The decolonial thinking as it came to essentially expand was also highlighting the importance of having a more complete, a more comprehensive uh, mapping 
of the set of relationships that had also pre-existed historically and had not necessarily been seen in the historical accounts. The decolonial thinking went beyond the particular perspectives of Asians, Africans, Arabs. Um, it has built an influence in many fields as a critical thinking that had, has influenced African American studies, Latino studies, Asian studies, many thinkers in Latin America, and more generally has impacted thematically a number of other fields, feminist studies, critical race theory, environmental studies, global health studies, taking us into an understanding of the world that was essentially shining the light on these approaches that had been missing all of these perspectives. The decolonizing thinking had led also to the understanding of concepts such as othering, such as positionality, and such as racialization, matters of seeing the world in, again, its fullness, as it were. Today, we see that decolonization is certainly not complete. The history of the states that had become independent in the 1960s is still very much a work in progress. Politically, the dependency, the asymmetry that they have been experiencing throughout these decades, some 60 or so decades, is still very much on in different forms. The challenges that the societies had to deal with in turn, additionally, in handling the post-colonial states, which largely became as predatory at times as the colonial systems was also an additional challenge during this period. Decolonization remains very much a challenge for these societies and the story is still being written in that sense. Decolonialism is also a work in progress when it comes to the mapping and the critical outlook that we bring on our understanding of the world. This is how the current issues that we are looking at in terms of race, in terms of the environment, in terms of health, in terms of the world of ideas need to be revisited through that prism all the time, giving us more of a fullness of that picture. In particular, at the level of the production of knowledge. In revisiting school and university curricula, decolonizing curricula has been a large undertaking by many students and professors and militants around the world. By doing such engagement, we come to see the world as in need of a critical outlook on its history and an accompanying of the movements of emancipations of these territories and places and spaces and identities for that matter. It is also an issue that is beyond the world of ideas important in media representation, in the corporate culture, in the mindset of the average citizen, all of these questions need to be decolonized in a way that we understand this with the proper and more elaborate fullness of seeing the world as it is, and in sort of the humanity behind these ideas, as Edouard Said once termed it, looking at processes that began 60 years ago.